everyone should hopefully be able to see that. So I always go to the Slack channel and I go to the announcements channel and then I view the pinned items. And once I do that, I can go down to, Emilio has a nice link to the schedule in his pinned Slack chat. So this brings you to the website with a schedule and today is Wednesday the 12th. So for the first 30 minutes, I will be talking about satellite data and accessing it through the cloud. After that, uh, Ben Tupper is going to be talking about raster data management in R from 1130 to 1215. Then we have a short break. And then from 1230 to 2, we have project uh, work and help desk. And we encourage everyone to get on the Slack and the Google Docs that are set up for the different projects and work together. And that's the schedule for today. Tomorrow we kick off at the same time with Valentina and machine learning and it's then our great talks for tomorrow. So tomorrow is gonna be great as well. Uh, today in the zoo, in the Slack, there's going to be um, the Stace and Allison are going to be monitoring the tutorial. So I'm gonna change mine to tutorial so I can try to monitor that a little bit during my talk. And when you have any questions or any comments about the tutorials as they're going on, please uh, just put them into tutorials and chat them as questions and they'll either be answered through the Slack channel or the, I will try to take breaks and answer them as I'm speaking. Uh, I'd also like to highlight that we have all of our um, channels for our different group projects. And if there's anyone on who's not part of a group yet or is having trouble getting started or doesn't really know what to how to contribute uh, I really or I really um, encourage you to to slack or you can direct message any of the organizers you can just go on the slack channel for the group and talk to the mentor but we're really hoping that you know the spirit of ocean hack week is that everyone work on some of these projects together and it's a really great way to meet new people and see different types of coding. So if you're not already involved or you feel like you're struggling to get involved, please, this is a really good time to reach out because we still have a couple more days and some nice time to do the projects this afternoon. Uh, the next thing is I'm gonna start doing my tutorial now. Did I miss anything, Emilio, or is that everything? That sounded good. Okay, great. So to get to the tutorials, if you go to the Ocean Hack Week tutorials, so over here, you can go to your Ocean Hack Week tutorial. So I'm logged on to the Jupyter Hub now. And there's one called 10 Satellite Data Access. I think these were originally written in order and I was probably the last one to upload. <laughs> So when you go into there, there's going to be some files, but the one that I'd like you all to open is called Access Cloud SST Data Examples. And that's the one that I have on the screen. I'd like to check that everybody can read my screen. Is that working out well for everyone? Great. And let me try and bring this over a little bit so I can see the chats. So. Accessing cloud satellite SST data. Satellite data can be really difficult to work with because the volumes can be enormous. And sometimes even to get started, you want to download, you know, either hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes even of data. So working with ones that are deployed on the cloud can be really fast. Unfortunately, there's not a huge number of them deployed on the cloud yet. But within this next year, a lot of them are going to be shown up, be, start showing up. Both NASA and NOAA and USGS are starting to really move data onto the cloud quite rapidly. So we're going to start seeing a lot more data now. This is just giving you an example of the, a few data sets for sea surface temperature, which is the area that I've worked in for quite a while and I feel more most comfortable with. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that data and then showing you how to access it. So satellite data, one of the first things to know is that 
it really comes in four different flavors. There's level one, two, three, and four. And you'll see these referenced in the file names a lot or in the descriptions. And it's really hard when you first start using it to remember what is level one, what, what are these? So you can think of level one is probably data that you're not going to encounter that often. Level one are the raw satellite observations usually calibrated and they're in an orbit format most often so each observation has a lat a long and a time and usually a scan number and a orbit position and an orbit number these are what are used to develop the geophysical retrievals that are then put that more people are familiar with using so the next level is level two, and that's where more of you would probably be uh, interested in accessing this type of data. These are derived geophysical retrievals like sea surface temperature or wind speed or cloud, you know, or water vapor. These are still in an orbit or in their original projection that they were collected in. And so each observation is gonna have a lat long time and a lot of other information about the sensor attached to it. These are really useful when you're trying to do studies where you want tight time and space co-locations, or if you're looking in gradients in fields and looking for differences, because there's no remapping, this can be a really powerful tool for analysis. The level three variables are then essentially when you take the level two and you map them to a grid. So these are uniform time and space grid, which make them much easier to deal with. It's similar to dealing with the level four data, which is then sort of either an analysis of the data or a model output. Like most of the level four are sort of gap free analyses and can include multiple sensors. So these are all, when you see those names bandied about, that's what they're talking about. These data come mostly in NetCDF, HDF5, and GeoTIFF. There's some newer formats called ZAR and Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF. Here we're going to be showing you how to access sort of NetCDF, HDF5, and ZAR from the cloud. So one of the things I like to emphasize is that satellite data, especially when you get it on the cloud, it can be really easy to gain access to it and really fast. But one of the really key parts of the analysis, and I've only learned this the hard way, so you're probably going to do this and then you'll learn it the hard way and go back. But it's really important to try and explore the data and read the documentation and understand as much as you can about how that data is collected and any potential issues that it may impact the analysis that you're planning to do. I mean, one example is when a satellite came out, it was in the uh, early, it was like 1998, and it was a satellite that had a, a low inclination orbit, and it processed through the diurnal cycle in 23 days. And about a year after the satellite went up, there were a lot of papers about 23-day cycles. And it was just the orbit procession. But you have to sort of re read the documentation and understand what the strengths and weaknesses of the satellite data that you want to work with are. And that's part of the reason why I'm here. So like now you all know me and you can direct message me and you can contact me in the future if you ever have questions and I can try to help you or understand what I know about some of the data sets. So these are really big data sets and we're running on the Ocean Hack Week Jupiter Hub. Sometimes these data sets are so big that you do run out of memory and you'll sort of see your uh, kernel reset. Uh, and that, that's just a limitation of what we're dealing with, but most of the data that we're working with here, you'll be, most of the time you'll be okay. But if you do get a kernel reset, that's what's going on. And you just have to restart and start again. So to run these notebooks, again, just hold down shift and enter, or you can use the play button on your window. And we're gonna start playing with the data now. So how do you find data on the cloud? I, uh, I'm going to introduce the AWS public data set program. That's what I'm most familiar with. Most data on there is free egress, which means you don't have to have credentials to log on and get it, which makes it really easy to access. There are one or two data sets on there, mostly SAR, that do have a requester pays so that you would have to have an account. I avoid those. So to get to the public data set, you can click in that window and it's going to bring you to the open data on AWS. To find data set, you just go to publicly find the data set and we're going to look at the MER SST. 
And you can also just scroll through all the data that you want. So here's the MER right here. I'm gonna click on this. And this is an example of what you're sort of faced with when you first get to a cloud data set. And it has a description and some licenses and some information. And it's really nice because there's almost always a contact. So if you run into questions, you can have the contact. And sometimes there's tutorials. I've generally found most of the tutorials somewhat inscrutable, except for, of course, the one that I wrote here, which is really well done. Uh, but a lot of the tutorials are, can I, I had trouble reading. And when I got to this web page, I'm looking at this and I'm like, what is an ARN and S3 and MER SST? And I don't even know where to start and how to read this data. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. And one thing that's important is that it also gives the AWS region. If you have the option to read from a Jupyter Hub that's in the same region, it will be much faster than in a different region. It'll still be fast if you're in a different region, but it's, it's quite a bit faster if you're in the same region. So going back to here, for those of you who maybe didn't have access to the web, I put just a screenshot of this showing you sort of the ARN. Now, MER SST is a czar data set, which makes it particularly easy to work with. And uh, this is in an S3 bucket. So that's the glob storage from AWS. So we're gonna be reading this czar data. And the reason that czar is so fast and easy is it consolidates all the metadata. Ah, what is czar? So there's a link to czar here that you can click on. Czar is a format that is optimized for cloud. It's used heavily in X-Array and you can, it's been used a lot also by the Pangeo group. What it does is when you read a NetCDF file, the metadata are sprinkled throughout the file. So when you start to have thousands and thousands of files, accessing the data is gonna be quite slow. And we're actually gonna show an example of that next. With Czar, uh, yeah, and so Amazon, uh, the Ocean Hack Week is in Amazon West too, so this is gonna be fast with the czar. So the czar takes all the metadata and it pulls it out and puts it into a JSON file. And that's what, when you do the lazy loading with X-Ray, it's gonna load in seconds, if not uh, maybe a minute if you're in a different region. But that's for petabytes of data. And so it's actually just lightning fast because you're not actually reading any of the data until you need it. And if you looked at the structure of a czar store, you would see directories for all of the variable names and then just random file names that are like 0 0.1, 0 0.0. Because none of it, you, you don't access czar data like you do with NetCDF where you're trying to construct a day in a year. You just read in the entire data set and then only access the data that you need for your computation. So it is my preferred format because it takes away all of the business about file names. And I think for a lot of the younger generation here and the people here, I think this is going to change how you do science because I was taught science within this structure of file names and directory structures. And with these new formats, that is completely disappeared. So first, we're just going to import some libraries. And so then after you import the libraries, I just ran that cell. Here, what we're doing is I've done the magic command time so that we can record how much uh, time each cell is gonna take. For a czar, all you do is you give it the structure of that uh, ARN that was in the Amazon cloud. So remember in, this cloud, it said S3 MER SST. So the way that you actually call the data set is a little bit different. You just say S3 MER SS3, MER SST czar. You then create a mapping to that S3 bucket using the library FS spec. And then you simply read in the data. So I'm gonna execute that cell. Yeah, so there's a question about whether or not it's worth converting large net CDF model data sets into czar. So I'm working on that right now with the ERA5 data. 
the ERA-5 data, it takes a couple minutes to read in one year of data. It's really flaky because it constantly runs out of memory and dies. And it takes uh, several hours to read in 1979 through present. When I convert it into a czar, it takes about one second to read in, and it's a much more stable because it uses much less RAM. It's just only accessing data when it needs it. So especially for model output, czar is a really powerful format. So this took 29 seconds. Uh, you now have access to, let's look at this. So we're exploring this using the x -ray. This is a global one kilometer data set that goes from 2002 to 2020. I think it's about three terabytes. So you've just read in the entire global one kilometer data set in a few seconds. And you can see the data variables here. There's SST errors, there's a mask, and there's sea ice fraction. And you can explore these data sets, of course, by clicking on any of these, and it's going to show you more information. So when you first get a data set, I spend a lot of time reading all that I can in the metadata to understand, like, okay, here's a mask that I can apply that tells me when it's land, when it's lake, when it's open sea. Hey, Shell. Hey, yeah? Sorry to jump in. Is, there, is it possible to maximize your browser window? I think that um, we're seeing multiple windows from our perspective. Or maximize the window in which you're displaying the Jupyter Hub. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Sorry. OK, so this is uh, reading 10 years of data at one point. What I've done is I'm selecting an analysis SST and using the X-ray select to do a time slice. I'm just picking a latitude and longitude, and then I'm plotting the data. So this, in one second now, I can plot 10 years in a time series. And when you're starting to do data exploration, having access through Czar just makes this so fast. It's a lot easier to understand your data and to start exploring it. And this is how I do a lot of my science, is I just sit there and play with the data until I understand it, and I try to plot it in a million different ways. And that's why these cloud-deployed czars can be really nice. So I'm actually going to plot the anomaly now. I'm creating a climatology on the fly. I'm calculating the anomaly and then plotting it. I'm also averaging it into a monthly average and plotting that on top of it. And this is all using the X-Array group by and resample commands. One thing I want to point out about X-Array is when you take the mean, there are these options and it's really helpful it took me a long time to learn this, but it's really helpful to read the documentation. So I, I tell you to read the satellite documentation for the satellite data, but it's actually also good to read the documentation for the different X-ray commands. One of the things that I really like about mean is that you can say what dimension you want to take the mean in, whether it's lat, long, time, and you can group them together in a dictionary to do over multiple dimensions. And the next thing is this keep adders true. So this, if you're, especially if you're going to output a data set, you can keep all the metadata. And this is the other skip nah. So this skips a not a number. If you have this set to false, it means that wherever there's not a number, even if in the time series, it will still create a value there. But for SST, you really don't want that because usually when there's a missing value, it's where sea ice is, and you don't want to create climatologies that only have a couple data points in them. So a lot of times when I'm dealing with this type of data, I put it to false. And here's the plot that it creates. And again, it just does this really fast. This would be, you know, if, if I was programming in Fortran or MATLAB, this would be several days of going through each NetCDF file and creating a climatology and then going through it all again to produce its plot like this. I'm going to show you a very high latitude time series. So this is the Chukchi Sea. And again, this is why I sort of advocate exploring your data. So what's going on here? So we haven't applied any masks to the data. And so the MER SST has a valid data point everywhere, even in regions where there's ice. 
but at these high latitudes in the winter, there's often ice cover. And so the sea surface temperature is set to minus 1.6. So if you were to take this data set and start looking at you know, annual cycles or doing climatologies without applying a mask to remove data with sea ice or maybe in lakes, whatever your interest is, it's important to try, to try and understand what's going on in these regions and to explore the data and read the metadata as much as you can so that you understand when this is looking right and when it's not looking right. The other thing I wanted to point out is, I'm gonna plot both of these. The grid resolution that many level four satellite data products or level three are gridded at, is not necessarily related to the spatial resolution of the data? So you can grid data at whatever grid you want, but there's gonna be an inherent spatial resolution to that observation. So a lot of level four analyses like the MER and many of the other level four, they rely on both infrared, which is one to four kilometer and passive microwave, which is 50 kilometer data. And the data availability is gonna determine these regional temporal changes in spatial resolution. So if you're looking to do frontal analysis or gradient analysis, this is something that you're gonna to wanna to be aware of. And I'm gonna show an example here. I've just plotted the same region for two different days. This is SST. And for any of you, this is San Francisco Bay. And for any of you familiar in that area, it looks a little blurry. There, there's much stronger gradients in the ocean temperature in this area. And the reason that it's blurry is this was a day when there was a lot of cloud cover and the infrared data wasn't available. So it sort of was only using the low resolution passive microwave. The next image that's going to come up, hopefully in just a few seconds, is one where there was infrared data available. And so you can actually see that there's a lot more small scale structures. So let's say you were looking at sub-mesoscale variability and you thought, well, MER SST, it's one kilometers, that's what I'm going to use. If you're looking at small-scale variability, and you can see how now here you start to see more of that small-scale variability, you need to understand that these gridded data sets may not always be representing the spatial resolution of the data. So I'm going to go ahead and start running this um, the next one that we're gonna do is uh, the geostationary data. And I'm gonna skip this, but you basically go through the same steps to find the public data set. And this time it has the same sort of ARN, which is just NOAA goes SST. This is a net CDF file. And so what I've done here is that there's several links. Uh, this has the information about the GOES data. There's 80 different products, everything from, sea surface temperature to clouds and water vapor and fire products. So there's 80 different products that you can look at and there's information on those products in that link. I find it really helpful with these type of data sets to understand and explore the S3 structure. And I've put a link here that shows you how to use HTTPS to do that. When you click on this, it actually brings you to an interface that you can click around, you can see all 80 products and you can start to see how the data is organized. And you're gonna need to do this because it's all in these small net CDF files. Well, they're not that small uh, because that's how you're going to read the data. You can't read it all in one line like you do with Czar. You're gonna have to go through and read and access each file. I've written a subroutine here that reads all the different geostationary data and I put it into a subroutine so I'm going to go ahead and run through this and I'm going to start this cell running because this is going to take a little while. What this subroutine does is it given a satellite a year and a day and the satellites there's three different geostationary satellites that have their data in the cloud. It then creates a file location and so first what I have to do is I actually have to list given that S3 bucket and that I want the SST directory, I have to then build a list that says, okay, in this year and in this day, there's then a couple more directories and I'm gonna look for the net CDF files. So I create a file structure and I link, I, I'm listing the files using FS glob. Once I have those file locations, I then create links to them using FS open. And this creates a link to the S3 file 
glob storage, and I can then use the X-Array OpenMF dataset to open all the files in a single day. I combine nested and I'm concatenating along the time dimension, so what I should end up with is every NetCDF file for each hour, their hourly files in this directory, so I'm going to have a X and a Y and a time dimension. The data is really messy for the GOES, and uh, Phoebe is one of our uh, projects has worked on cleaning that up. So I will be updating this notebook with her code that's going to clean the data up a little bit. So it's still thinking. It takes about three minutes, actually, to open up a day of GOES data. And this, again, is because of this net CDF structure. So we're probably going to just get to the point where we're ending this tutorial right when we finally get the data read, because this takes so long. This is just for one day. And so another uh, one of our group projects has been uh, Patrick has been working on putting some days into Czar store. And the difference between it takes about three minutes to read one day of Go's data, it takes a few microseconds to read it once we put it into Czar. Unfortunately, we're just going to do a few days because it's big data. The geo data that you have access to through this subroutine, the goes east and west, which is the east coast of the United States and the west coast of the United States, but it's equatorial. So they're centered on the equator and it extends up to almost 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south. So you actually have quite a bit of South America as well. Those data um, are available in this X and Y. So it's the original projection that the geostationary data is collected in. It's not a regular grid. So you have to, if you wanted to do it with a latitude and longitude, you would have to transform that grid into a regular gridded product. The Himwari data, which is over Japan, is in a slightly different format called L2P, and it's also in an L3 format. So they have the routine here returns the L2P data, which is in, again, the geostationary mapped, but you can get the level three gridded data for Himwari by just changing the subroutine to access that level three data. So yeah, so it took three minutes and 19 seconds. And again, I'm just going to quickly show you this. The data is a little bit of a mess. But Phoebe is going to clean this all up for us, and we'll have it all cleaned up for you guys. The next step is we're going to plot just a single day. Because X, we're just taking a subset because it is quite a big data set. It's at one kilometer. And so it takes a while to, plot, to subset it. So what we're doing here is we're subsetting it. Then we're using the X-ray where command to only use the highest quality sea surface temperature pixels. And then we're just going to plot for time 14. And then we just plot it with the color map. And it's in Kelvin. So here we go. So now we have access to a day of data. This is really powerful to me because the GOES data is, I believe, 120 gigabytes per day of data. And when you start to look, the sea surface temperatures are just beautiful. And you can start to really see the submesoscale structure and start to do science with this. But when accessing the data requires weeks of downloading, it just becomes prohibitive. So now you guys all know how to access this. Further along in the tutorial, I show you how to do the Himwari. And then I look a little bit at the ERA5 data. And I'll just leave those for you to do on your own. I hope this was helpful. And it's 1130. So maybe we have time for a couple of questions. But I'm going to hand it off to Nick now. And feel free to DM me with additional questions. And uh, I'm happy to answer. So thank you. Well, before I transition, Sophie, were there any other questions on Slack? Yeah, there, there are a couple here. One, um, which satellite products would you use to quantify cloud cover to make the quality index for the MER SST? So there, I can't remember if MER has, they were at one point going to implement this, and I wasn't sure if they had. So let me look real quick. Some of the satellite data sets, so no, they don't have that. Some of the other satellite, level four satellite data sets 
actually have a variable that tells you whether it's infrared or microwave or both. MER doesn't yet have that. It's difficult for you to quantify the cloud cover because I think there's five or six different satellites going in and there's a temporal and spatial window that they use in the interpolation. So it's almost just visually is the only way at this point that you can tell whether or not it's high resolution or low resolution. I am hoping that in their next iteration, they will include this flag that says whether it's IR, microwave, or blended, because it can make it difficult for science when you don't really understand the spatial resolution. It often is one kilometer, but not always. Sorry. Uh, is this a daily SST? So yes, this is a daily SST. Are there any other questions that you think I haven't answered? There was just one more um, about FSSEC. Yeah, I was hoping you wouldn't ask that one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So FSSEC, I actually, uh, it's at this point, I just treat it like a magic function. My understanding, which is I tried to read the documentation and I sometimes find a lot of the documentation for some of the Python routines to be written by developers and I don't have that background and I, I feel like they've written it into a different language sometimes. As far as I can tell, FSSpec is just creating a mapping from your Jupyter Hub to the file location. And that's all that I understand. And I'm not even sure that that's right. But that's, it says get mapper. So if I say it's making a map, that, if somebody else knows the answer, they should speak up. Shell, I'm sorry for putting you this up. I wrote that question. And mostly <laughs> yeah. just because I wanted to comment on it. It's an abstraction for file for um, file system format. So regardless where the data lives, S3, HTTP, or whatever, all the comments that you expect on a file system will work. Oh, great. So, so if this was HTTPS, I could still call this and then do the XR command. Yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you, Felipe. I should have known. I should have seen it was you. Is there a straightforward to way to convert? Yes, that is to czar and a file name. So it's an X-ray command. And I have some examples uh, where I've made czar files, and I'll make sure that those are uploaded to the tutorial. We also have one in, I think Patrick's uploading in the uh, gap-free project directory repository. If I can chime in on that a bit, that uh, XRA does make it straightforward. There is, uh, like Shell said, it's uh, two czar. The trick, the trick comes in uh, in taking advantage of czar, where you do chunking. You have to make decisions about what, how to chunk, um, and that uh, takes some practice getting used to what's actually a good chunking scheme. But just converting literally to czar uh, is easy. Yeah, and and. One thing that there's, if you're just using it yourself, the ideal file size, like I'll write out some test czar stores with just a small bit of the data, but you sort of want about one to 200 megabyte files. So you can play around until you get to that size with the chunking and then write that out. That's really to make it much more efficient, but even not doing that. So when the, we did the goes data, uh, we didn't, rechunk it at all, we just rewrote it as czar. So there's ways to optimize it for the type of science that you're doing, but even the initial step of just putting it out into czar and not worrying so much about the chunking, it can still be really powerful. <laughs>